Unexpectedly, Patro received word that he was to return to his home country. Mysterious matters needed to be sorted out, and Patro was the only person who had the authority to set things straight. The bad news took him by surprise. Initially, he considered taking his daughter along, but the journey would not be without danger. Things were risky. Relying on the company of teachers and scientists whom he had brought together around his daughter, he decided not to take her with him. Meanwhile, Condamnita was becoming increasingly impressed with the stories about Sifo, the amazing inventor and researcher. Her empathy and compassion grew as she longed to meet this young man. One day, the talkative physicist proposed that they venture out of the house. He would arrange a meeting with Sifo. Nervously, Condamnita consented to this. She had never left the building and didn't want to cause her father any distress. The physicist convinced her that Patro never forbade her to leave the house. He had simply never opened the door for her. Patro would certainly have no objection to her meeting Sifo. The young man was, after all, no stranger. With tense anticipation, she watched her teacher open the front door. Now she would be faced with that big unknown world that had always remained beyond her limited field of vision. The meeting with Sifo was indescribable. It was as if the two souls became one. They spoke with each other for hours, then days and nights. Sifo liberated her from her isolation and allowed her to see life's magnificence from all sorts of perspectives. Beautiful, ugly, harsh and relentless. With pain in her heart, she understood the love that Patra had given her. She also saw that his protection had deprived her of real life. Sifo was now handing her a mirror in which she had never looked. As much as she did love Patro, the time had come for her to think of herself and to take leave of the man who had meant so very much to her. Condamnita and Sifo decided to marry in secret. She would never return to the house where she had grown up. Sifo had a beautiful silk gown made for Condamnita in China, where the loveliest and costliest silk came from. On the solemn day, he presented her with a silk handkerchief on which a deer had been embroidered in gold. A variable work of art, likewise, handmade in China. The deer was carried out with so much detail that one kept on discovering more mysteries in it each time one looked at it. If one looked at it long enough, it was possible to make out figures on its back. The antlers displayed mysterious shapes as well. Anyone could spend hours looking at the deer discovering something new each time as mysteries were unveiled in the process. Every aspect offered a new approach to a story. Konamnita would always keep the handkerchief with her. It was her most prized possession. The highly refined deer symbolized her husband's love, a symbol of longevity, happiness, peace and harmony. Sifo had the use of a wonderfully equipped laboratory and received financial support from Patro. Throughout the space he had set up his strange devices, large and small that displayed mysterious gauges. He had spent months organizing and equipping his workplace. The functions of these machines were anything but self-evident. Pipes blew off steam now and then, Sparks went off all over the place. 
Sifo had created a workshop for tuning his instruments. All sorts of whistling, buzzing and ticking could be heard there. An uncoordinated harmony of sounds caused by hot boilers and spinning gears. Diabloso Plori had been hired by Patro to assist in the laboratory. One day, Sifo showed Diabloso the skull of a recently deceased monkey who had reached a ripe old age. So you keep all the skulls of your monkeys when they kick the buckets? What good are those empty monkey heads? Diabloso sneered. Sifo responded animatedly. Don't you understand? That gives the souls a place to inhabit. Sifo had only warm feelings for his army of monkeys and paid tribute to them for years after they died. He was so passionate about this that he scarcely noticed that his assistant was poking fun at him. Diabloso sniggered and walked off muttering. Dead is dead. What kind of soul would be looking for a house to live in? After all, they've got no arms or legs anymore. Diabloso wasn't exactly the ideal assistant. He showed little commitment. Patro had forced him to take this job. Actually, he just loafed around and let Potenza Troppi, a somewhat slow-witted servant from Patro's household staff, do all the work. Diabloso contributed little as far as the experiments were concerned. These were of no interest at all to him, and Potenza had no understanding of what went on in the laboratory. Unquestionably, he simply carried out the orders given by Diabloso. Thinking wasn't his forte. One day, a good-looking young man came to the laboratory with an ailing monkey. He was concerned about the animal's condition and feared that it might not survive. His name? Marco Bonsanza. Sifo attended to the sick creature and Marco proved to be very helpful in the process. Diabloso had taken off, leaving the mess to Potenza, who had no idea what to do. Marco, who genuinely loved animals, seemed to speak their language. Impressed by this considerate behavior, Sifo suggested that he come and work with him. The next day he hired Marco as his personal assistant and Diabloso was made responsible for keeping the laboratory clean. Marco was richly rewarded with a salary that amounted to nearly twice that given to Diabloso for his services. This did not sit well with Diabloso. Seething with rage, he snarled, Who does that brat think he is? Just wait, I'll teach him a lesson or two. My friends, I must say that events when seen from a distance often seem futile or irrelevant. Gazing, analyzing, and calculating from one universe to another, I initially regarded Diabloso's jealous anger as that of a spoiled child not getting his way. But the more precisely I began to check my calculations in detail, that very distance soon allowed me to see that his gusts of jealousy would develop into a pitch-black tempest of unprecedented proportions. Patro returned from the trip to his home country, where political upheaval reigned. One party blamed the other for wrongs and vice versa. The dispute had reached such a pitch that the country was on the verge of a civil war. Patro called for a meeting of the two group's leaders and explained to them that there was no such thing as extremes. Everything hovers around a center, where the origin of the subject is nothingness in a state of calm. 
At that point of balance, there are no differences. Due to outlooks on life and experience, some lean towards the right and others more to the left. As long as there is mutual respect, everything can be interpreted differently, even though things continue to hover. That keeps life interesting. After all, the subject has one and the same source. It is objective. But when someone adds his emotions and ideas to this, that balance immediately shifts. This easily gives rise to misunderstandings, which can then get out of hand. Everyone starts making points to more extreme terms, and ultimately the groups are so far removed from each other that unity seems impossible. Patro was a charismatic man who had great powers of persuasion. He managed to bring the parties back to the moment at which they had lost sight of each other. Then he asked them what their reason was for choosing a direction that went beyond their original view. Dead silence. Patro broke that silence by asking them, Are you able to discover your similarities rather than oppose each other's differences? The latter leads only to unreasonableness. Patro's wise words had led to peace in his country. He had managed to unite his people. Difficulties were resolved, conflicts settled. He did not take sides, on the contrary. Through the application of simple logic, he merely unraveled the mysteries that had led to misunderstandings. On his return home, Patro found his daughter's bed unslept in, and books in the study were covered in a layer of dust. Since he left a month ago, Condamnita had not been there. His staff informed him that they hadn't seen Condamnita since his departure. Emotions got the better of him. Betrayal, deception, lies, that thankless child. He was a master of objective observation, but as often happens among highly skilled statesmen, on being personally affected by fate, any form of logic goes down the drain in a storm of uncontrollable thoughts. Reason makes strange moves. Patro tormented himself with aimless mood swings. He sent for Diabloso, his trusted servant. Diabloso explained that youths reach an age when they develop a curiosity about their environment and the opposite sex. You've always wanted to protect her. Let her go. She's a grown-up woman now. You've given her the best upbringing, lessons in life and a solid education. I've heard that she's secretly married to Sifo, a desirable match. An inventor whom you support because of his creations that serve humanity. Perhaps it comes across as a betrayal that they've married in secret. Ah, my dear Patro, they're young and in love and make impulsive decisions. You are away for an indefinite period. With all the dangers in your country, it wasn't even certain that you would return safely from this dangerous mission. After all, that's why you left your daughter at home. Patro lost his patience. Let Sifo prove that he's worthy of my daughter. He demanded that Sifo throw a knife to split an apple on Condamnita's head. Diabloso sniggered to himself at the thought. He had Patro precisely where he wanted him. Actually, dear friends, the encounter was held in an architectonic astrological structure built centuries ago by my uncle, Rai Putsawa. 
Sifo had little desire to prove himself. What a senseless contest. But as he happened to be a master knife thrower, he split the apple in one throw without hurting Konamnita. Patro could hardly accept his defeat. A woman who marries in secret can never be trusted. Sifo replied curtly with some degree of irritation. A father who puts his daughter in such danger can never be the real father. Now Sifo had touched on a sensitive issue. things hadn't been bad enough. That remark about his not being a real father had really rankled Patro. He challenged Sifo to a duel. Kota Roxasa's traditional scratch duel held at full moon. The first to suffer a scrape loses. The evening was planned at the same location where, previously, the apple and Condamnita's head had been split at the ancient observatory. Condamnita knew nothing about this duel. Her maid, Laborista Respondia, was the sole witness and wanted to be certain that the man-to-man -man fight ended well. The full moon was bright and big. Sifo danced about until its light blinded Patro. In a single stroke, he wounded Patro with a razor-sharp knife and gorged a cut into his chest right next to his heart. Sifo had grown up as a street kid and knew every trick in the book. Knives, swords, daggers, it made no difference. He could do thousands of moves. Patro was a politician. He didn't stand a chance. The fight was over in less than a minute. In his rage, Patro exclaimed once again, A woman who marries in secret can never be trusted. To this, Sifo responded, bowing his head in reverence. A father who puts his daughter in such danger can never be the real father. But so far, he's been an excellent educator. I hereby attest to my respect for all that you've done to raise Condemnita to be a beautiful and sincere woman. Patro froze. He knew that Sifo was right. He had lost himself in blind rage and now realized that Sifo had been brave and honest. He was aware that Condamnita had reached maturity, that Sifo was a desirable partner for her. Back when he met him, he had been surprised by his abilities and convinced that he should support him in the development of his instruments. Sooner or later, Condanita would be leading a life of her own. To keep her to himself would mean turning her into a prisoner. Patro was a man of few words. Taking Sifo's hand, he joined it with Condamnita's left hand. The left hand is closer to the heart. And by doing so, Patro, the aristocrat with only one name, sealed the marriage with his approval. The moon vanished behind the clouds and peace descended upon the city. A refreshing downpour soothed everyone's spirits. Meanwhile, Diabloso had heard of the victory by which Sifo had won Patro's confidence. This was not at all what he had in mind. He had to come up with another crafty plan. He knew that Potenza Trompi, the dwaddling servant from Patro's staff, had always had an eye for Condamnita, 
and could thus be very useful in his double-crossing dealings. Trompe would be generously rewarded for his services and ultimately guaranteed Condamnita's hand in marriage. After all, Trompe could easily be deceived and couldn't notice what he was being used for, nor would he even realize the impossibility of such promises. His less than keen sense of reality would make him all too easy to manipulate. In his attempts to achieve a highly unrealistic goal, he would make the biggest blunders. Sifo gained more and more respect and authority in the city of Kota Raksasa. With his instruments, he not only healed monkeys, he also saw to it that people in poor health came to have a better life. Pain and physical ailments disappeared, and in the process, mental insecurities diminished as well. People who had long ago given up on themselves were coming back to life again. They referred to Sifo as the dragon, the symbol of power, strength, and happiness in Chinese mythology. Sifo carefully selected the people whom he wished to support. His supply of devices was still limited. Although production had increased, he was not able to keep up with the demand. Stories about the magical effects of his devices spread quickly, and growing numbers of people wanted to have such a clever gadget. Some of them weren't even sick. They presumed this thing would guarantee them of eternal youth. That's how it goes when an invention becomes popular. The tales about it surpass the reality. One night, Sifo had a dream about a serpent-like dragon going up in flames. It was the Naga, which warded off evil spirits and guarded sacred relics. Sifo felt it was an ominous image and wondered what it could mean. His healing devices were sacred to him, and the results that he achieved with them were famous among the local inhabitants. He feared that his dream was a sign of adversity, that might affect him or the entire city. Fear is a bad counselor. Distress about what could happen is often greater than what actually does happen. Sifo's activities suffered as a result. His achievements continued to be amazing. His love for his wife grew by the day. They were happy and lived in a beautiful house. Many workers were now employed at the laboratory and countless instruments were being produced. The devices became increasingly refined and achieved better and better results among people who previously had no chances whatsoever. But that vision of the blazing Naga being totally destroyed, he couldn't get out of his mind. He never talked to anyone about it. Even Condamnita was unaware of his concern. Presuming the pressures at work were getting to him, she advised him to rely more on his lab assistants, to delegate more responsibilities. Indeed, they had already proven their expertise some time ago. A few of them were so inventive that they had markedly improved certain details. Diabloso, too, detected Sifo's restlessness. Just prior to this, he had visited a malicious alchemist, requesting that he sow doubt and confusion in the heart of ever-confident Sifo. This alchemist, who had never managed to turn lead into gold, was a vicious, 
bitter type of person that no one would want to have as an opponent. He had been led astray by the production of very different qualities. Chemicals, for instance, they influenced human thought. These would induce delusions that could scarcely be distinguished from reality. The conniving alchemists have given Diabloso a powder to stir into Sifo's drink. Child's play, since he was stuck with lab maintenance and providing staff with food and beverages. The toxic drug caused Sifo to have nightmares and daytime visions. Under its influence, his character changed and he became full of oppressive and suspicious feelings. It narrowed his mind. He began to distrust people. Gradually, he arrived at the notion that certain people in his workshop could be sneaking off with his inventions and ideas. They would be out to screw him, implanting the wrong instruments in order to do damage to his reputation. His mind was poisoned. As distrust can make a person turn sour and cause him to carry out deeds inconceivable to a sane person, Sifo unconsciously began to lose his compassion as misleading thoughts took hold of his mind. As I gazed at the stars and watched all that went on in the second universe, I began to worry about the course of this history, the love story that I had worked out from the position of the stars. A shift in my observations occurred. Just when an event took place in the distant future, I immediately began to figure its consequences. That wasn't at all reassuring. It was time to risk a leap into eternity. Now, my friends, it becomes really confusing as to where I was and at what point in time. The tale moved me and I became more and more involved in it. As a consequence of this, my personal perspective began to shift. As the sun set, it cast a magical light across the most sacred temples in the city's vicinity. One of the most exceptional and gifted souls among my ranks of my helpers stood completely motionless in the sanctuary. He possessed the ability to anticipate events before they took place. Frequently, he spent the time meditating in the grounds of this consecrated temple. His body would grow rigid when he sensed that something terrible would soon happen. Not moving a muscle, he seemed literally, his eyes, mouth, limbs, to become as stony as the temple. At daybreak, I found him in that state. Something was definitely wrong since any attempt to rouse him failed. A thorough investigation had to be carried out. A battle might need to be fought. It was time to swap the white costume for the red one. I went off to wage war, wanting to know where the spark had ignited a fire. One of my companions ran along with me to the city's catacombs. Normally drifters would be warming themselves here by the small campfires, but now a fierce fire was raging. The stench of petroleum was everywhere. It looked as though someone had thrown oil on the fire in order to divert attention. This was by no means an accident or coincidence. No vagabond would have access to so much fuel. In fact, such characters would try to sell the petroleum rather than simply waste it by burning it. Odd, not a poor devil in sight. Usually they came shuffling in around this time of day getting their little fires going again in those oil drums and warming up leftovers, most often things they had found on the street or fished out of garbage cans. But now there was nobody, and the oil drums were gone. All was ablaze, an inferno. No drifter would dare set foot in this place. I couldn't fathom it. Did someone want to chase the vagabonds away? A small opening had an iron gate across it. There, too flames broke out. 
The gate was bolted tight. Its steel lock nearly melted away from the heat of the inferno. To what did the passageway lead? Diabloso had hired his sister, Laborista Respondia, to be Comnamnita's personal aide. Being familiar with her taste, she would go into town to buy clothes for Condamnita. Condamnita was fond of light colors and had a preference for white, often beautifully embroidered garments in delicate brocade. Laborista would come home with the loveliest outfits. She was the sole companion to Comnamnita who had no friends and lived in isolation. Labarissa told her how and where she purchased the clothing, or sometimes had things tailor-made. She showed her just how precisely the tailors did their work, how they would feel the fabric and imagine how it would feel on the slender woman's body. Condamnita was all ears. It was like listening to a fairy tale about a far away land. Laborista was completely loyal to her mistress. She had no idea, however, about her brother's jealousy and evil intentions. They had grown up together and had shared all of their secrets ever since they were children. And so she had told Diabloso more about Condemnita's private life than was permitted. Diabloso maliciously took advantage of this and made her tell him things that he was not supposed to know. This gave him the power to manipulate things. She had confided in Diablo so that Sifo had given his wife during their wedding ceremony a precious handkerchief on which a beautiful deer was embroidered in gold. Diablo so begged his sister to show it to him. He was a great admirer of art and craftsmanship. It was, after all, no coincidence that Patro had made him responsible for the management of Sifo's laboratory. My dear brother, that's impossible. She carries the handkerchief with her constantly and places it beneath her pillow at bedtime. When she's sleeping, she won't notice if you carefully remove the handkerchief from under the pillow. After some degree of hesitation, Laborista consented. Little did she know that her brother was scheming to bring about Sifo's demise. That evening she helped Condamnita with her nightgown, combed her beautiful long hair, brought her a glass of water, fluffed up the pillows and tenderly tucked her in. With the last movement she managed to filch the handkerchief and hide it away in her pocket. Blowing out the candles, she then left the room.
gateway that had caught fire in the city's underground passages continued to haunt me. I had to know what lay beyond it. I summoned my crew and had them put out the fire. Then my magical powers, powers that I developed while calculating time, were put to use. I had become a shadow in time. While living centuries ago, I journeyed through time with my army of helpers and calculated what would happen. That provided me with a view of the future and enabled me to move from moment to moment. This is how I came to know the art of making myself invisible. I could disappear into thin air. No door could stop me. Apparently I could walk through walls. What was happening gave me an odd feeling, as though I had gone missing or lost my place in time. Having found my way to the municipal archives, I studied the maps of the city. Despite my thorough search of the records, I came up with nothing. While everything about the underground environment had been indicated, not a single drawing showed the gateway. This baffled me. The gateway did indeed exist. Why, at that very moment, had the fire taken place around that mysterious entrance? Had someone wanted to conceal something? Or worse, camouflage it? Suddenly I recalled a vision of a woman in a cave and sensing that I had to protect her from any evil that might befall her. The fire stirred that thought in my mind. Concentrating, I went back to the time when the city was being built. Gradually, the interest came into focus. It led to the space which now happened to be Sefo's laboratory. I moved a bit forward in time and saw how years before, Diabloso had hidden this passage in municipal records. It was a secret passage or a concealed exit. Something fishy in any case. So why had that fire broken out then of all times? Were visitors not wanted in the vicinity of that gateway? Was secret information being smuggled out of the laboratory via this passage? And has Sifo been right about his manipulated visions of his inventions being copied and misused in order to tarnish his reputation? One day, Diabloso went to visit Pala Justa de Solaron, just the person for his crafty plan. Pala was a charming woman with narcissistic traits. Any attention she could get enchanted her. Not that she had any empathy for those who showed an interest in her. She could assume various guises, sexy, defiant, intellectual, entertaining, a lady with style and a sense of formality, but also a playful and bubbly tramp. Her appearance on the stage of life took many forms as her guises adapted fluidly to any new situation. Able to wind any fellow around her little finger, she manipulated, seduced, lied and told half-truths. Long before dumping one, she had lined up another, nor did that one last long. Paola devoured men, and because fear of attachment and fear of abandonment often go hand in hand, Paola would leave men before they would leave her, one after the other, having no qualms whatsoever, not an ounce of loyalty. As the numbers of lovers that she left in despair grew over the years, so did her loneliness. True love she had never known or acknowledged. She was merciless, tough and heartless, crude and insulting. Pala could not be trusted. She was made for Diabloso's scheme. Diabloso at work in his office, 
had assigned Potenza the task of solving a number of pointless problems. Had Potenza possessed any sort of intelligence, he would have instantly understood that this was a sheer waste of time. Diabloso had invited Paolo with the aim of introducing her to his most brilliant assistant. Hey, Pota, you've got to practice a bit before you start anything with Condamnita. Paola blew him a kiss and swayed her hips seductively. Far from being a Casanova, Potenza lost himself in shyness and uncertainty. But his heart was racing. Overcome with passion on seeing this temptress, he had no idea what to do. His desire surpassed his timidity. Come on, big guy. This is the chance of a lifetime, Diablo so sniggered. Look how she's rocking those hips. Could she be any more obvious? Get a move on, fella. Practice makes perfect. How do you expect to get anywhere with Condamnita if you can't even handle this? Diabloso gave him a shove and Potenza landed in the arms of Pala, who then smacked a kiss right on his mouth. From there, it's easy to guess what happened. <laughs>